What's going on, Journey family? How are we feeling this morning? Right on. You guys are awake. First service was like, no, nah. these guys are the cool people. I like it. Uh, it is great to see so many people here on Father's Day weekend. Super cool. And happy Father's Day to everyone. And happy Juneteenth tomorrow. I am thrilled that this is a national holiday. I never take for granted that I can stand up here and talk to you guys like this. Uh, if I had been born 200 years ago, that would not be the case. My life would look very different. So uh, I'm excited about this holiday weekend. I'm thankful for all of you uh, here sharing it with us. I'm Gary Mitchell. I'm the worship pastor here. And I always want to start by giving it up for our worship team, the folks here on stage and off stage who are leading us in worship. Shout outs to our violin player, Matt Vegel. We're so glad that he's here today. Um, I would love to have more cool, different instruments like that on stage. So look, if you're out there today and you're like secretly some ninja level like saxophone player or cello player or something, you better come talk to me, man. It's not that scary up here, I promise. Stop hiding. I'd love to find a way to get you involved in what we're doing here because that's what it's all about. We as a church are in the midst of this sermon series called Better Together, where we're just talking about how we're supposed to live this thing out as a family, as the, the kingdom of God. We're framing that around the book of Philippians. And if you've got your Bibles with you today, and I hope that you do, because that's a great way to just take notes, write things down. Um, I've got kind of an interesting uh, passage to talk about today that honestly took me uh, a little while to kind of unpack. So I hope that you guys will, will lean in with me, get your brains on, and I invite you to study the word of the Lord together. If you're with me, say, let's do it. So we are in the book of Philippians. I know that Chad has been giving us the backstory on this book for the last few weeks, but just in case you haven't been here, the book of Philippians is written by a guy named Paul who wrote like most of the New Testament, and he wrote this as a letter to a community of Christians in a city called Philippi, a.k.a. to the Philippians. So these are people that Paul has mentored in the faith. He's taught these people. He's baptized them. So he knows these folks very well. And starting in chapter 2, we're going to be in verse 12. This is what Paul says to this community of believers. He says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. So Paul says a lot here. We could like sit here all day just chewing on this. But there's actually only three things right now that I want to pull out and kind of unpack. Starting with, check it out, the thing that could be the most problematic to understand. Here at the tail end of verse 12, Paul says to continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I remember uh, reading this verse in high school when I first became a Christian and wondering what the heck I was supposed to do with that. So let's start with this phrase, work out your salvation, because we can really kind of get into a lot of trouble with this if we're not careful. In fact, before I tell you guys what I believe that this means, I want to start by telling you guys what this doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we are to work for our salvation. Paul is not saying here that our salvation is dependent on how much effort we put into it. That implies that a, a right relationship with God is something that we can do, and that is not true. And if that's what Paul was saying, he'd be contradicting himself in a bunch of other places in the New Testament. Our salvation is in Christ alone just like we just sang about a couple of minutes ago. And the Bible as a whole teaches that God is perfect and we are not. And the only way that we can have a relationship with a perfect God is if God himself does something to fix it. That's where Jesus Christ comes in. God's son who died to pay the penalty for our selfishness. Everywhere in the Bible where you see the word sin, 
if you replace it with the word selfishness, I think it, means, it makes a little more sense. So Christ's death and resurrection has created a way for our um, spiritual default, if you will, to be forgiven. So our status before God, being reconciled to him, is not something that we can do. It's done by accepting and surrendering to what has been done for us. In the book of Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says this. This is kind of like the short way to, to explain it. He says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot get to heaven by just trying harder to be good people or good Christians or something. And if you're out there today and you're like a, a do-it-yourself, pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps kind of person, good for you. But you need to know that you will not, you cannot get into heaven by being self-reliant and determined or something. It does not work. The Bible says that all of our righteousness is like filthy rags in God's sight. So no, we can't get to heaven by trying harder. And that's why that is exactly not what Paul is saying when he says, work out your salvation. So Paul is not telling us to work for our salvation, to save ourselves, then what's he saying? The Greek word that Paul uses here that's being translated as work out basically means something like to carry to completion or to follow through with it until it's finished. You can think of it kind of like to iron it out or to work out the kinks. I believe that Paul is saying that a relationship with God is not a passive thing. We don't get saved, get baptized, and then lean back and go, well, I'm good. Guess I can just coast until I die, right? Like, that's not what it's about. We need to lean forward. We need to be active participants in this process of, check it out, sanctification. That's a really fancy church word for just becoming more like Jesus, living out the mission, this identity that he's given us. That's what's going on in this passage where he says, work out your salvation. It means live it out. Learn how to walk in this new identity. Keep working through it. It's sort of like uh, if you have a laptop computer that you loan to your child or your tween or whatever to finish a homework assignment, just because you're giving them this incredibly powerful tool, that doesn't mean the assignment magically gets completed, right? Like they still have to do the work. Christ has given us this priceless gift, something we could never attain for ourselves. It's done. It's paid for. It's in our hands. Here you go. What am I supposed to do with this? Use it. Develop it. Live it out so that we can share it with as many people as possible. So this is the first chunk of this passage that I want to talk about today. And here comes the second part. Let's go back and read this again. This is verse 12 again. And Paul says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act uh, in order to fulfill his good purpose. Paul says we're supposed to do this with fear and trembling. Does that mean that we're supposed to be afraid of God? Yes and no. Throughout the Bible, this phrase, fear of God, usually means having a healthy respect and a reverence for God. Paul is urging believers then and now to pay tribute to and to honor the greatness of God in our everyday lives. Let's do it like this. We're going to do like a, a, a visual exercise right now. I want everybody in here to close your eyes. Go ahead. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. And I want you to picture yourself at the beach, all right? You're standing in front of this vast, powerful, endless ocean. Or if, if you're not a beach person, because I know not everybody is, instead, picture yourself in the middle of a big open field in the middle of the night, and you're standing there underneath this endless night sky filled with stars. One of those two images should do it. Now, when you stand at the beach or at the mountains or under an endless sky, what do you feel? 
you feel this sense of wonder and awe, but you also feel kind of tiny and ridiculous, right? That's called perspective. That's how we should feel in the presence of God. We need to approach God. You guys can open your eyes. We need to approach God with a certain posture of wonder, of awe, of being overshadowed by something that is so much greater than ourselves, the greatness of God. The book of Proverbs chapter 9 is just one of many places in the Bible where you find this. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So this phrase, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, is Paul encouraging us to maintain an attitude of humility and reverence before a great and a holy God. Does that make sense? Now, just to play devil's advocate to myself for a second, let me say this. A little fear is a good thing, I think. Fear is an emotion. Emotions have a purpose, even the ones we don't like. Fear is there to keep us safe, to make us careful, to make us pay attention to things that we might miss otherwise. So I think a little fear in certain situations is a good thing. And I would argue, listen to me, that it's okay to a point to be afraid of God. Because here's something we don't talk about a whole lot in church that I believe is true. God is scary. God is scary because God is God, capital G-O-D. And there are plenty of places in the Bible where God says something or God does something or God shows up in some way, and people are terrified. God is scary, y'all. Some of you are familiar with the Chronicles of Narnia uh, book series, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and The uh, Magician's Nephew. And um, this is a, a fantasy book series from renowned uh, author and theologian C.S. Lewis. Um, they're great books, and a couple of them were actually adapted into some fairly decent movies a few years ago. But I love that C.S. Lewis made Aslan, his God character in these books, a lion. And a big lion, too. Now, obviously, he got that idea from Scripture, but I think it's very appropriate because if you've ever seen a lion before, they're beautiful animals. They're very um, regal and authoritative. You know what else a lion is? Freaking dangerous, right? A lion is a frightening thing, especially a hungry lion or an angry lion. And there's this word called territorial that nature takes pretty seriously. And I love that Aslan in these books is described as being beautiful and mesmerizing and captivating and terrifying. Imagine a lion the size of an SUV, mane and claws and teeth and all. If an animal like that wants to rip your head off, ain't nothing you can do to stop him something that can roar and shake the building. Guys, that's God. Raw power and majesty and holiness. And yes, he is good and he is kind and he is merciful. Yes, he loves us and he pursues us and he forgives us. All that stuff that we like to sing about. But he's also capital G-O-D God. He is no joke. He is second to no one, and you do not want to be against him. Now, look, some of y'all grew up in church traditions where all you heard about was the wrath of God, right? Like you got the, the scared straight treatment, and I don't think that that's healthy. I do think we need to be talking more about uh, God's compassion and his um, desire for relationships with us. But I do worry that these days we've gotten a little bit too casual, a little too comfortable, a little too unimpressed with the lion sitting at the top chair at the table. So yeah, in this passage, Paul is encouraging us to have respect, a, a, a healthy um, a careful consideration of how we live before God. 
But if I may say so, I think a little more fear of God might do all of us a little good. Let's go back and read uh, these verses one more time, and I hope that something I've said so far has kind of helped this coalesce a little bit. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Thank you, Sarah. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. Work through it. Apply it. Live it out with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. If you're still with me, say amen. The final nugget of this passage that I want to talk about, mainly because I'm actually so bad at this particular thing, and I'm secretly hoping to find that I'm not the only one, um, is this bit at verse 14 where it says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Some of your translations say grumbling or complaining. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Do everything without grumbling or complaining. I don't like that verse. It bothers me. Do you see what I did there? I'm grumbling and complaining about the verse that's telling us not to grumble and complain. Um, let's do it like this. I'm going to make this really easy. Raise your hand if you know somebody who's a grumbler, right? They just complain about everything. Nothing is good. Nothing is right. Always got something to say. It could be somebody in your, one of your coworkers. It could be um, one of your teachers, one of your classmates, could be somebody in your own home. I'm going to just let that go. God forbid it's somebody in your church. But these grumblers, they're like a drag to be around, right? Like it's draining. Like nobody wants to hang out with somebody like that. You see them coming and you're like, ah, oh, man. Here's the thing. How we respond to these grumblers is very important. But here's what I want to say. If you can't think of anyone in your life who's a grumbler and a complainer, well, is it you? Are you sure it's not you? <laughs> You're fine. You're a baby. You guys go for it. Um, the thing about this scripture, guys, is that Paul doesn't say have nothing to do with the grumblers or complainers. He doesn't say respond in love as Christ to the grumblers or complainers. Paul says, you people, you guys, you family of God, you Christ followers, you don't be that person. We need to make sure that we are not the grumblers and complainers in life. Because the truth is, grumbling and complaining are kind of not allowed for Christians. If we really take seriously the attitude that the Bible says we're supposed to have. This is just one of many, but let's look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where Paul says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let's just hit one more. Colossians chapter 3. Paul also says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be what? That's just a couple. Paul has a lot to say about the peace of mind that confidence in God is supposed to produce in your life. So if we Christians, we know all of that, we've read all of that, we believe all of that, and we're still walking around whining and complaining about stuff, what does that say about our beliefs about God? Because that's what it comes down to. Who are you complaining about, really, if you're discontent with life? If you're unhappy with your circumstances to the point where you have to huff and whine about it all the time, 
like a sponge. Somebody is squeezing a sponge. You are a sponge that life is squeezing, and this discontent comes oozing out of you. Out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. What does it say about what we believe about God? When we get together with other Christians and all we do is, is gossip and complain and criticize things. Some of y'all left churches or left church because that's what it was. And you better not let non-Christians hear us talking like that. That is not a good look. That's, it, it, it is unbecoming of a person who claims Jesus Christ as their Lord and their commander to have a grumbler attitude. What are you saying about God? What are we teaching our co-workers about who God is? Do people want us around? There's supposed to be something different. Do people want us around because we bring smiles and, and release and brightness to the room? Or are we the ones that they turn away from when they see us walking in the office? They see us coming, ah, oh, man, I was having a good day. Parents, fellow parents in the house, here comes an ouchie for us. Do you wonder why your kids are always grumbling and complaining? To a certain extent, they're kids, and that's what they're for. <laughs> but did they learn that from us? Do they hear us grumbling and complaining about things and arguing about things? Or are we teaching them patience and perseverance through the words that we speak? Are we facing the never-ending stream of challenges and frustrations in life with an attitude that we want them to pick up on? Don't be the grumbler, guys. Don't be the storm cloud. We're supposed to shine like stars. That's what this passage says. So how do we do that? What are some next steps for us? What are some practical things that we can implement? I want everyone here to pull out your phone. You know you've got it in your pocket. Pull out your phone. I'm giving you permission to have your phone out in church, all right? Pull out your phone, and I want you to get ready to write something important down. You can open up the notes section of your phone. You can send an email to yourself, just wherever you write stuff that you want to come back to, okay? I want everyone to take a second and think of all of the things that you tend to complain about and write it down. You say, what do I complain about? My job, my spouse, my kids, my classes, my teachers, how everybody else drives on the road. Not you, I'm sure you're fine, not you. What do you catch yourself complaining about? Is it the news on TV? Is it the politician or elected official you can't stand? Is it the political party that you're against? Hello. Get honest with yourselves. What do you complain about? Is it, it might be a group of people who don't look like you, speak another language, who dress a way you don't agree with, who have a lifestyle that you don't agree with. Get honest with yourself. Nobody's going to see this but you. What do you complain about? Your in-laws, your co-workers, DMV traffic, how those people are ruining everything for the rest of us, whatever. And right underneath that, here's what I want you to write. Number one, pray for, dot, dot, dot. Underneath that, number two, thank God for and ask him to use, dot, dot, dot. And underneath that, number three, what can I do slash how can I help with whatever? From now on, every time you feel the need to complain, I want you to catch yourself and pray. If that person is getting on your nerves again, if your job, your boss is stressing you out again, if the DMV traffic is making you cross-eyed, whatever, before you open up your mouth to complain, this is what I want you to do. Number one, pray for whatever or whomever. Pray for that person that is annoying you. God, I ask you to bless that person today. I pray for their physical health, whatever they might be feeling, whatever they might be dealing with. God, I pray that you would give them a good day. I pray that you would let them encounter you 
in whatever they're doing, in big ways and small ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you tried that? Praying for whatever it is, praying for whoever it is. Number two, thank God for whatever. God, I thank you for this traffic. When was the last time you prayed that? <laughs> God, I thank you for this traffic because even though it's making me late, at least it's giving me time to spend with you. And then find some worship music or a Christian podcast or listen to God's word in the car. Sidebar, did you know that most Bible apps these days have an audio function that will actually read the Bible out loud to you? Do you know that? Next time you're sitting in the reds on I-95, pull up Psalms or Matthew or Proverbs or, I don't know, Philippians. Listen to God's word. You're always complaining that you don't have time to spend in God's word anyway. Now you're stuck in traffic. What else have you got to do? And number three, what can I do slash how can I help with whatever? Instead of grumbling and complaining, ask God, what can you do to help? And then go do something. Take action. Get involved. Go volunteer. Go help with that ministry. Donate your tithe that month to an organization that's working in that area. Go buy old so-and-so a meal. Hey, man, I was on my way to lunch. You want to come? My treat. Have you tried that? Go buy those people that make you feel some kind of way some groceries. Hi, God cares about you. So do I. Here's a card, 50, $75 of groceries on it. Here you go. Don't bother grumbling and complaining when you could be talking to God about what we can do. And then go take action. Do something. If you're still with me, say, all right, man. All right. Let's go back to where we started uh, at the beginning. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Live it out. Keep working through it. Keep developing it. How can we do that? I have three suggestions for you guys today on ways that you can move forward and develop your faith, regardless of where you are on this journey. The first, believe it or not, is a summer reading list. I did you a big favor. I surveyed the entire staff here at our church from our pastors to our outreach director, all the way down to my new worship intern that just started this week. And I had all of them give me three suggestions for the top three books they've read in their life that have blessed them and challenged them and helped them grow in their faith. And we have compiled a summer reading list for you. Take out your phone that might still be out, actually. Scan the QR code that's on the seat in front of you. That code is going to take you to a list of options. Find the summer reading list, click on that list, and check out all of our staff recommendations for books that you can read. We even went so far as to include hyperlinks. You can click on any of those books, and it will instantly take you to a link where you can read about the book, where you can buy the book. It took us a really long time. I mean, I guess it did. I made my intern do it. Um, <laughs> thanks, Tyler. I encourage you. Check out that book list, find something that you're interested in, challenge yourself to read or listen to, because many of them are available on, on audiobook as well. That's my first suggestion. Check out the summer reading list we put together for you guys. My second suggestion is to join a life group. We talk a lot about our uh, neighborhood groups that are called life groups here at The Journey, because it's really one of the best tools that we have for spiritual growth. By being part of a life group, you guys get to know other people here in our congregation, just normal people just like you, probably people that live near you, and you study the word together, you pray together, you do life together, and most of all, you get to share stories. Stories are so powerful. You get to hear what God has done in somebody else's life. You get to share your story with them so it can bless and encourage somebody else Man, you want to talk about a great way to work out your salvation, to live this thing out? Do life with other people. So right now, our neighborhood life groups are kind of on a summer hiatus while everybody is like on vacation and going places and stuff. But we're already working on planning our fall semester of life groups. And we'd love for you to be a part of it. If you want to join a life group, if you want to host a life group in your home, 
if you want to become a life group leader or an apprentice leader, any of that stuff. Again, scan that QR code, click on the connection card tab that's there. If you fill that out, there's a little thing that says, I want to join a life group. Click that, fill that information out, and somebody from our team will be happy to get in touch with you. So that's suggestion number two, join a life group. And suggestion number three is serve. Serve in ministry somewhere here at our church. When you join a ministry team and you help us put on this whole crazy thing that we do on Sunday morning, you're getting, re- you're getting able to work with other believers, other people just like you who are in different places in their walk with God. You get to learn from each other. You find out that you're just normal. We're all just people trying to figure this thing out. Jesus Christ, who spent most of his time wandering around helping people, said that he had not come to be served, but to serve. That tells me that one of the best ways that we can become like Jesus is when we are giving up our time and our energy and maybe a little of our sanity to help other people experience this whole thing. Raise your hand if you volunteer, if you serve in any capacity here at our church, if you do anything from the parking team to anything. Would you say that you have been blessed and grown from that experience? Wonderful. I'm glad to hear that because the the truth is we need you guys. We need volunteers to have church. That's just the, the reality of it. It takes so, so much work to do all of this, from the parking team outside to the greeting tents to the people downstairs watching our kids to everything that you see and hear up here from the stage. It's a lot. And many of you guys have heard the 80-20 the joke about churches. Have you heard this? How most of the time in churches, 20% of the people end up doing 80% of the actual work, it's really easy for the workload, the brunt of it, to fall on the same people in church. And if you don't believe that, can I just tell you guys that even though he didn't want me to say anything about it, while I'm standing here right now doing his job, our lead pastor, Chad Simpkins, is serving downstairs in Journey Kids. You know why? Because we need more volunteers in Journey Kids. He was supposed to be off today, and instead he's downstairs plugging holes in the schedule. So, yeah, I don't mind being honest that we need volunteers. We need you. Regardless of whatever your situation is, wherever you are with all of this, I promise you there is a place for you here to pitch in, to help out, and to experience being part of God's family. Again, if you're interested in that, scan the QR code. Everything you need is there. There's a tab that I think says something like serving team or serving in ministry. Click that tab. Check it out. That's my three suggestions for how you can work out your salvation, how you can keep developing it, keep nurturing it, walk in this identity. Join a ministry team, plan to join a life group in the fall, and check out that summer reading list that is available for you guys. Just coming to church on Sunday morning is not enough. That's a great starting point. Thank you for being here. We're glad you're here. But it's the starting point. It's not supposed to be the end goal. And uh, I want to close with this. My wife and I, when we first moved to this area, we ended up Uh, in an apartment complex in Alexandria. And while we were there, my wife wanted to start taking advantage of the gym, the great gym that was in this apartment complex. She said, let's go to the gym together. I used to love walking the treadmill and stuff when I was younger. We should start going to the gym. Let's go to the gym together. Come with me to the gym. And me, being the supportive, cooperative husband that I am, I said, I don't want to exercise, but I will go with you to the gym if you want to go. So we started going to the gym together, and what would happen is that Miranda would walk or jog on the treadmill or do the elliptical or whatever, and I would sit next to her on the weight bench and play Legend of Zelda on my Switch. And um, this went on for se- What? This happened in the first service, the judgment, see? That's what I'm talking about. 
<laughs> this went on for several weeks where well, we would go to the gym together, and Miranda would be in there running, jogging on the treadmill, getting slim and, and trim, and I would sit either on the bench or somebody needed it, I would sit on the floor in the corner and play Breath of the Wild. Now, I still maintain that I was having more fun than everybody else in there. But I admit that somewhere around the time that I finally got the Master Sword, I kind of looked around and I was like, you know, <laughs> all of these people are getting healthier and getting stronger and getting slimmer. And even though there's no reason why I can't do what I'm doing, I'm pretty sure I'm cheating myself out of what I could be getting out of this experience. So if you're here this morning, and normally you come into church, and you listen to some good music, and you listen to an okay sermon, and then you hit, say hi to a few folks on your way out, and that's it, don't get me wrong. We're glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us. Keep coming back. But I want you to know that coming to church every single Sunday and not doing anything with what you are being given, not taking advantage of what is offered here, is a little bit like going to the gym every day and playing video games. Is it better than nothing? Yeah. But there's a ton more that you could be getting out of it. So I invite you, I challenge you, continue to work out your salvation. Take your next steps on this journey, regardless of where you are on it. Scan the QR code, get involved. You'll be glad that you did. You'll be blessed for it, I promise, and you'll be helping a ton of other people experience God's kingdom the way it was meant to be. Almost like, I don't know, we're better together.